Can everyone see that? Great. Awesome. So hello everyone and thank you very much for letting me come to talk today. Um, talking about my favourite thing, which is fossils. Now, um, the title of the talk is Fife Fossils, but obviously over the last six months or so, I've pretty much been confined to West Fife, which is where I live. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is round about Dunfermline and the limestone deposits there and the material that I've been collecting. Um, but I just wanted to start by sort of introducing why I really love fossils and why I think it's quite important to sort of get them out there and make them accessible for everyone. So some of the sites that I've been looking at are actually on private land um, where I have permission to hunt. Um, a lot of that, a lot of the time you do find that there's not necessarily good conditions to take kids and things fossil hunting in these areas, um, but there is still important uh, material to be collected. Um, so that's one of the things that I'll try and discuss as well is, is sort of what I'm trying to do with the material that were found. Um, before I do go into that though, um, just a wee reminder about the Scottish Fossil Code. So if you are looking to go fossil hunting, it's a really good idea to look at this from Nature Scott. Um, have a wee read and it'll tell you about uh, the code of conduct and when you can collect fossils and when it's legal to do so. Um, one of the things about Fife is that a lot of the coast here is actually triple uh, SI. Um, this is a map here which shows you all those red areas um, are marked as triple SI. Now with the first to fourth triple SI, it's not all due to its uh, geology. A lot of it's to do with its fauna and its habitats and the sort of coastal ecosystems that we have. Um, but the geology is a big part of that. So it also means that on the Fife Coast, you can't actually um, hammer the bedrock or collect material from there. But that doesn't mean to say you can't go and you can't find some awesome stuff that's in situ. Um, but it is something that, that should be uh, bared in mind when you're going to go fossil hunting. And I'll go into a bit more detail later about how you can find out about these kinds of sites as well. Um, but just a little bit of background of Scotland and where we were in the Carboniferous. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is um, the very early Carboniferous, uh, about 330 to 340 million years ago. Um, at that point, Scotland was sitting pretty close to the equator and um, we, we had quite a tropical environment, which is why we get a lot of deposition of our marine limestones. Um, at the end of the Devonian period, um, we know that the Devonian had... Um, the rocks of the old red sandstone, we know it was a more arid environment, but then as you move into the Carboniferous with the change in latitudes, you do get that more tropical environment. But some of the rocks in the later Carboniferous do move back to an arid environment, so it, it is constantly changing due, due, through geological time. Um, so the Carboniferous period is about 360 million years ago that it started and it lasted for about 64 million years and the most famous thing about the Carboniferous is obviously the coal that comes from there and I feel that a lot of the time when people talk about the geology and things around Fife, um, rightly so, it is connected back to the industry so a lot of the mining and everything that you see here is basically done because of those coal deposits. It's the same across the Midland Valley and we have a lot of a uh, good industrial resources here and when you look at the um the rocks that you find and what they tell you about the environment um, it'll tell you a whole lot about our ancient seas and our coral reefs that were there so the coal comes from your land bearing stuff and i'll talk a bit more about plants later on but what i'm really interested in is marine fauna um, and during the Carboniferous, the Midland Valley, Valley was basically in a grabbing structure. So um, it was bounded to the, the north and the south by faults. So you had the southern uplands to the uh, south and uh, the Highland Boundary Fault. And because of that sort of lowland area of the Midland Valley, the grabbing structure, we were able to then accumulate sediment, which is why we have a lot of the rocks that we uh, now see. So a lot of uh, Fife is underlain by uh, Carboniferous geology. So this is a very simplified geological map of the Firth of Forth. And you can see most of that sort of blue area is all Carboniferous. So there's your Carboniferous sedimentary rocks. You do also get some um, Carboniferous um, igneous material which occurs locally as well. Um, that occurred a bit later on in the Carboniferous. But the rocks that I'm looking at are um, from the Strathclyde group and uh, they are centred around sort of western Farmland. And this is just a stratigraphic map, a stratigraphic log showing you the different time periods. And the one that I'm interested in is the Visean here. So this is the age of the rocks that we're looking at. 
and um, the Tunisian is a lot more famous because this is where you start to get um, tetrapods, so you start getting animals moving from the sea to the land. Um, but also in the Bicene, and during this period, that also gave rise to a lot of other evolutionary trends, um, particularly uh, among sharks. But the limestone deposits of West Fife um, that I'm really interested in is the Black Hall limestone. Now this has had quite several different names throughout history. Um, it's quite well known as the Charlestown Main Limestone. It outcrops at several different areas. Um, most of these have been quarried and it was burnt as a, a lime for mortar and for uh, agriculture. But you can still explore some areas where there's outcrops of this. Um, the reason that this rock is, it looks so beautiful, so you can see on this left hand image here, you've got a lot of crinoids in cross section. Essentially what's happened with this rock is quite soon after burial, um, there was then dissolution of components within the, the rock. So things like crinoids, where you had um, hygienic material, that was dissolving and creating pore space. Uh, later on, you then had pore fluids, uh, which were traveling through the rocks, which have then later precipitated within the cavities. Um, sometimes these can be used as way up structures, um, geopetal indicators in limestone. So you can sometimes work out which way the rock uh, was when it was deposited uh, due to these different minerals but something that we see quite a lot in the black hole limestone is this sort of precipitation of uh, smoky quartz within crinoids and it is incredibly beautiful and there's a few places that you can actually go um, and see this uh, which I'll mention a bit later on as well. Um, but basically the, the rocks that you're looking at from the Black Hall limestone represent an ancient carbonate reef, an ancient coral reef environment. Um, so most of the, the rock is made up of fossils, so you'll find absolutely tons of remains of corals and brachiopods and all different types of invertebrates in there. And usually scientists will use these uh, different types of corals and things as indicators and it gives us an idea of the age of the rock and can help us correlate it to other parts of um, other outcrops elsewhere in Scotland. And uh, the picture here is showing what's called the bioherm, which is essentially an ancient uh, bioherm and ancient uh, coral reef structure which were very prominent in the Carboniferous. Uh, round about Dunfermline we see these more than we do in other parts of Scotland with the same age of limestone and that's just to do with how much space we had and how high the ground was in relation to the surrounding landscape. Um, and that distinguished you know, how, how high the sea level was and when you get these structures forming within your reef environments you then start to get differential water movement around those mounds so it creates very unique environments within that formation itself so the limestone is so invariable which is one of the things to me that makes it so fascinating and um, you know you could spend absolutely years studying this stuff and, and still find new things um, but one of my favourite things that I've been looking at a lot during lockdown is rugose corals. So corals are really important in, as I said, a stratigraphic indicator, but they are also incredibly beautiful. In the top image up here, you can see um, these are preserving the uh, tabulae and the septae where the animal would have lived. So um, these are horn corals and they're called that because they are, they do resemble a horn. And these have been cut and polished just so that you can see these internal structures. Um, the bottom one here is really interesting because you're actually seeing sediment infill in the top. Um, so that gives you a bit of an indication of um, what was happening at the time when that animal died and whether or not it was transported. Um, the only thing is though that because a lot of this material has actually been quarried, none of it is really in situ anymore, which creates an even bigger problem because obviously you don't know exactly where it's come from in your, uh, your rock succession, so you don't know exactly what the environment is. So that's something that obviously we need to try and cover as well. On the right hand side though, um, we've got a coral here which is really cool because it's shown signs of seasonal restricted growth. So these bits where it's kind of going narrow is actually where there's probably been poor conditions for that coral to grow. And as such, you're seeing these uh, constraints. So hopefully at some point I will get this cut and polished because it'll be really interesting to look at the structures and see if we can see any sort of deformation in the growth. Um, but next up we have crinoids, which are probably the most famous fossils that you find in limestone because a lot of the limestone around here is literally made up of crinoids. 
So crinoids inhabited shallow water and they grew in clusters and they're quite often referred to as sea lilies, but they were actually animals rather than plants. Um, and they would have had a stem that attached to the sea floor, but because these animals uh, were quite fragile, when we look at modern crinoids, which live in very deep ocean environments now, um, we realise that they're, it's very rare for them to actually preserve intact. Um, and that's why you do end up with these big blocks where you get big uh, meshes of crinoids, and that's normally referred to as crinoidal limestone. So one thing that's uh, really cool about this is that essentially you are looking at this record of the seafloor um, and there's a few places uh, that you can see this around Fife and the best one to go to is a place called um, Preston Island which is in West Fife. It is, uh, just, it's an artificial island which was created and it used to be a salt pan uh, but now the sea defence on uh, the far side of the island, you can walk right round and that whole sea defence is made out of this black hall limestone. So unfortunately you're not able to go in and hammer this material or collect it, but you can walk along and you're actually able to get a glimpse into these really ancient sea floors. And um, some more about crinoids here. Um, this is just saying what I was uh, saying earlier about how obviously after death they get mixed up but sometimes you are able to use these as sort of current indicators so in some instances you will find that the crinoids are stacked in a certain direction and in geology and sedimentology uh, we like to look for those kind of structures to tell us a bit about what the the environment what the water flow was doing at that time and um, i spent a lot of time looking at the stuff in situ uh, round about west fife and because of these uh, bioherms that were forming um, you're actually getting so much different uh, water flow that it's really hard to pinpoint um, which direction the main flow was coming from other than it was somewhere to the west um, but here's some more examples of crinoids and how absolutely variable they can be. So what you quite often find is that the material that the, the crinoids are in, you might have a shaley matrix, which is a lot softer. Um, that means you basically get the crinoids weathering out. And in this photo here, I've just collected some mud and washed that out. And it's just full of all these tiny bits of uh, crinoid stems. And they range in size and shape, um, different species, and they can get to be absolutely massive as well. So this one on the left here is probably one of the biggest uh, crinoid stems that I've found, um, about uh, 1.5 centimetres. And, um, you know, that is huge when you look in comparison to all these little stems that you have here. Another place that's a really good place to look for um, different fossils is along the coast and as I mentioned obviously it is a, a triple SI but you are still able to go and have a look and what happens with the sea is you get a lot of preferential weathering and you do get a lot of really really nice crinoids weathering out so this bottom uh, bottom left image here uh, that was taken from the beach and because it's just been washing around in the sea you're seeing these crinoids weathering out and there's a bit of a crinoid arm in there um, you know and there's a bit of a crinoid plate there so lots of material available uh, the one in the middle here and um, this is one that i found quite recently when i was looking to find out where these big crinoids were coming from in particular from the the rock outcrop um, it seems to be that they like to uh, sort of accumulate at the edges of these bioherms. So if you can imagine you've got your, your corals living there in this environment, water flowing around and crinoids are getting broken up and just getting washed up against this bioherm and you just end up with this big absolute mess of crinoids. Um, and these, there's obviously quite a high, high energy environment to be able to move a uh, material that is quite big. Um, so it raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, this one on the right hand side is a really cool one which looks more like a, a robot than a crinoid. And because it is quite rare to find them intact, particularly in carboniferous rocks, um, kept this one together. Um, this is in my friend Sam's collection and it is like the, one of the coolest crinoids I've ever seen. But the problem you get with your crinoids, as I said, is they do start to break apart. So quite often you are only going to find these little bits. 
Um, over history, these have been referred to as all sorts of different names, like St Cuthbert's beads. Um, you know, they've been found um, along the beaches. They're quite common in Jurassic rocks. Um, in Jurassic material, like in the Yorkshire coast, you're more likely, it's still very rare, but you're more likely to find an intact crinoid just because of the type of depositional environment. Um, in the top right hand corner here, um, I've shown the full stem on the right hand side and next to it is a stem from a crinoid which I actually had put into acid for a while. Um, I wasn't intending on dissolving that crinoid, it was actually just there and I was using it as a, an aid to prop up something else but it just quite nicely shows how there is different mineralization within these crinoids. So they're not just uh, calcium carbonate, the outer layer is the calcium carbonate, but within the middle, you're getting silicification occurring. And this silicification, this, the silica doesn't dissolve away in acid, so you're, you're left with this behind. And it's just a really good way to see the internal structure. And there would have been a central hole that went right through the animal, and that was called the lumen. And that's where the animal's uh, sort of nerves and everything would have gone to control the movement of its arms and things. Um, very, very fascinating animals and they are probably by far the most common thing you will find around about Fife and particularly on the beaches. So it's certainly something to, to keep your eyes out for when you're fossil hunting. Another thing that I really love is bryzoans. So bryzoans are uh, still around today and this example here is actually so well preserved that it, it could be mistaken for a modern bryzoan. So you can see that they're, they're map forming structures here and they're very, very intricate and they can form huge bioharms within this material. So there is certain layers that you come across um, where different animals like brachiopods and things have actually been encrusted by bryzoans. And it's just a really, really nice thing to see those different associations of fossils uh, next to each other. Um, and if you look closely in this one here, you can see this little imprint and that is part of a crinoid stem. Um, and there is other lots, little bits of crinoid mixed in, in amongst here. And this material is quite shaly. And um, this is part of what's called the uh, Nielsen shell bed. And this is a layer of shaly material which occurs just above the black hole limestone. Um, a lot of it's not in situ, um, as mentioned previously. So um, finding this material is quite hard. Um, but when you do, um, you do find some of the most exceptionally preserved fossils. And then um, onto the next one is brachiopods, which are also uh, a very famous and iconic fossil. Um, so this was um, some brachiopods that me and my friend Sam stumbled across one day, and we just thought it was quite cool that these were two big gigantic productives that were, you know, they were just sat there on the path, and we thought, let's take these and clean them up. So they basically went from this big slimy mess uh, to this. Now, I'm not taking the credit for the prep on this because this was all Sam. Um, I don't have the patience to uh, grind down that much limestone because this material is incredibly hard. So all the matrix here is incredibly crystalline material. But as you can see, all these gigantoproductors here are actually all sitting in their life position. So you're, what you're looking at is actually the bottom of the bed. Um, but the really interesting thing when we started looking at this and cleaning it up was that we started to see more things popping out there. So um, it's quite hard to see on this photo, but there is actually a little brachiopod sitting on top of the giganoproductus there, uh, which is really cool. And you've got a little bivalve sitting in here and crinoid here. And this we think here is a sharp tooth but the even better shark tooth is this one down in the corner. So this was completely unexpected when we picked up this block because um, if I go back to this picture, you can see that it was actually just a, a complete mess when we discovered it. So this has been hours and hours of prep work have gone into this. Um, and this is a close up view of the, the shark tooth here. So when we collected this, we tried to break it down to size just to make it a bit more manageable to, to carry. But on doing that, um, we realized that there was a tooth in there. So um, Sam has managed to save this by getting it back together and then prepping it from the other side. Um, so that, this is another thing that's quite important to remember about fossils is, is sadly not all fossils look like they do when you see them online. 
Um, so quite often when you find something, it, you are going to have to do a little bit of work to uncover it. Um, so with shark teeth, it, it's a very skilled process and, and Sam is incredibly good at doing this and understanding how that, that shark tooth is sitting within the rock. Um, but because I started talking about sharks, now that is the main thing that I'm interested in and really wanted to try and introduce people to um, was just how mad the Carboniferous sharks got in the Visean. Um, so moving on a little bit, um, the, the vertebrates in the Carboniferous, as I mentioned previously, um, you did get the important step from animals moving uh, onto land. Um, there's a really incredible project about this called the Tweed Project. Um, the website there is uh, tetrapods.org. Um, highly recommend going on there and having a look at all the research and things that have been done because it's, it's super important and um, some incredible work there. Um, and it happens to be where uh, some of the sites happen to be where I grew up um, and went to school. It's a wee place called Burnmouth, um, which also has these early Carboniferous rocks. But moving back to Fife, um, and because we have these marine deposits here, what I'm particularly interested in is these early sharks. So sharks are chondrichthys, and these are basically cartilage fish. So sharks, what makes a shark a shark is basically it doesn't actually have any bone. It is made out of cartilage. But the most famous thing I think most people would uh, agree with me about sharks is obviously their teeth. Um, a lot of people do ask me about, um, you know, why did they go so mad at this point? So I, I'll try and explain this to, to the best of my ability. But when you get to the, the end of Devonian, you had a, your mass extinction event, which killed off um, about 75% of all species on Earth. Um, and that actually um, gave rise to uh, the sharks having no predators like they did before. So things like placoderms, um, their demise actually allowed sharks to then move into these eco ecological niches that previously they weren't able to. So I can't really mention Carboniferous sharks without uh, mentioning probably the most famous of them, which is Stethicanthus. Um, these are very famous from uh, Bear's Den and there's samples in the Hunteria. I'm not going to talk about uh, Stethicanthus today just because I um, haven't been looking for that. It's uh, not the same material that I've been collecting. Um, but it's definitely uh, an interesting and awesome uh, fish that you should check out. Um, but sharks, uh, Sharks are one of evolution's most enduring uh, success stories, um, even though they don't actually have very many hard parts. So, I mean, why is that? Um, a lot of that is to do with basically the bias in the fossil record. And it's something that's quite important to realise when you're looking at shark teeth, you are actually just looking at that small part of the animal. So a lot of the Carboniferous sharks are actually only knowing, known from very few isolated teeth. Um, so we don't know how did those teeth fit together in their mouths and um, what were their full dentitions like this is a, a huge big debate in in science and when it comes to shark taxonomy and um, that is an incredible debate on its own which i'm not going to go into today because i don't think md really wants to hear that but if you do feel free to to message or tweet me or anything so I'll happily uh, sort of go into that but basically the the gist of it is there's a lot of arguments about whether different teeth are actually different species or they just belong to the same species but in a different part of that shark's mouth um, so when you think about modern sharks and modern fish and how their teeth are arranged, um, you know, the morphology of their teeth is essentially designed and evolved um, to, to go with their eating habits. Um, and the reason that we find so many shark teeth in the fossil record is just because of, um, they were preserved as phosphate. And that means that we quite often get very fine details of these shark teeth um, preserved in the in the rock which is really important for identification but again you still have that whole issue of you can find loads and loads of teeth but at the end of the day you know you still don't know what that animal actually looked like unless you can find a uh, preserved articulated material which is obviously always the the dream um, the sharks of west five here is a list um of the species that myself and Sam have found uh, round about uh, West Fife. Uh, this diagram on the right is from Wikipedia. It's just shown you the, the main branches of the chondrichthys. 
So the uh, main ones that I'm interested in is where you get your elasma branch and then you get your holocephali. Your holocephali are like crusher sharks. So I'm not going to talk about these ones too much today, but holocephali are the ones where they would be eating mollusk and things and they have tooth plates rather than teeth, which would have had grinding surfaces. Uh, things like Simodus um, and that you that was a really good um sort of design for them at that point um, there's other sharks in there as well that are uh, holocephali and these crusher sharks are a lot more debated than uh, your elasma branch and that's basically just because it, we still generally don't really understand what they were doing and it's if there's no modern analogy for you to look at um, and compare it to it is very hard to then try and work out what was that shark doing, how was it eaten. So a lot of it is based on, you know, as far as we can tell from uh, modern relatives. But a lot of the really cool uh, carboniferous sharks sadly don't actually have any living uh, ancestors. So out of the 16 sharks here, this is from uh, one deposit. So uh, this is looking at you know, quite a big uh, species diversity within uh, this limestone. Um, we know from the different types of sharks here, um, so our most common one that we find is your petalodont sharks, like Petalodus acuminatus. Um, you find loads and loads of Petalodus, but the reason that you will find these ones more than you will find a crusher shark tooth is the holocephali don't actually replace their teeth during life. So your petalodonts would have been like your modern sharks that do that, that have rows of teeth. So when they lose one, another one will just take its position, which is why in the more modern uh, fossil records, you do find a lot of shark teeth there as well. Um, but I'm going to have a look at some of my favourite. Um, there's a lot of different uh, types here, as you can see, but I'm going to just look at the my three main favourites that kind of show how different the elasma branch kind of went in the, the early Carboniferous, and hopefully you guys will agree that they are really cool. So the petalodonts, here we have three different examples of Petalodus acuminatus. So um, these are from different views of the mouth, which is why they look slightly different. So this part here at the bottom is what is known as the base or the root. Um, most people will call it the root, but it's, it's kind of frowned upon because they don't have a root in the same sense as uh, mammals did. So um, normally scientifically uh, you'd refer to that as the base. Um, this top part here is your crown and they had really sharp cutting edges, these petalodonts. So um, this one was, this one's called Petalodus acuminatus and you can see how acuminate and pointed uh, those teeth are. So this is one on the right is one that I prepped out of the rock just with some uh, vinegar here. And um, the only bit that was shown was just a tiny bit of the basal ridge in here. And all it needed was, you know, some soaking in vinegar and uh, some steady hand with a pen. Um, and then the one on the left hand side here, this is one that Sam has prepped. And you can see this has been in quite a hard rock as well, where you're getting these uh, silicified crinoids there. Um, and it's quite hard to actually, you know, gouge into to silica to break it down so there's quite a lot of work involved in getting these to look as nice as they do and um, this one in the middle here is an interesting one which is a uh, preserve and this is from basically the side view of the the animal's mouth the side position um, and this one as well has a very uh, sort of thin cutting tooth and so they would have probably sliced their prey um, when they were eating them and this is a little diagram here that I've drawn which shows you where the base and uh, the crown are um, but in the simplest terms uh, shark teeth are very similar to, to what they were um, in terms of their composition um, the one on the left hand side here is uh, another pet lotus decuminatus so you can see they do vary a lot in shape and size so you will get some that are absolutely tiny. I found some that are only about uh, four millimeters. And then you've got ones here, you know, that are, are going up to two or three centimeters. So there, there is a lot of variation. Um, but normally uh, the crown here has a layer of enamel on it, which is, is really interesting because this enamel is sometimes perfectly preserved and you can actually see um, colours within that. If the rock's been sitting out and weathering for a while, um, you do get some really beautiful weathering colours uh, shown on the crown. 
which is something that you look for when you're looking at a rock is normally vertebrate material does look quite significantly different to uh, your invertebrates. Um, so this one here um, has been sort of prepared out of the rock and left on a base just so you can actually see how sharp that is. There's a slight bit missing out of the tip of this, which is really interesting because in the pet lotuses that we do find, this is actually a really, really common thing. So we are starting to wonder if this is actually something that happens quite regularly during the the shark's lifetime and it was just a common um, you know, flaw with their tooth that this point was maybe weaker. Um, just because it's something we come a lot come across quite often. So we're being keeping a hold of all the teeth that even may look broken. And um, so hopefully we can do some analysis of those and work out exactly what's going on. The next one that I'm moving into is my um, absolute favourite shark, which is Cyvoda striatus. Now this one, I would say, probably resembles a shark tooth more than a pet lotus does. Um, so you can see here, it's got a big central cusp, um, and then it has these two cusps on either end, and then lots of little cusps in between. Now what they think that these are, these are Cladodon or Tinacan sharks, and what they thought that these did with their prey is basically they would pierce the prey uh, with that big cusp and then they would just swallow their prey whole. So they were probably feeding on smaller fish and other sharks like petalodonts. Um, it's quite interesting that these type of shark teeth um, aren't as common in the sites where you find a lot of petalodus. So they were clearly living in a different environment and from the matrix that we found those in, um, we're starting to think that obviously Cyvodus, because it could grow up to nine metres long, um, you know, it was kind of the Carboniferous equivalent of a great white. Um, it was huge, would have been a big predator and very likely would have liked deeper water than the smaller petalodonts would have. But some of their teeth can measure up to 60 millimetres um, and they are absolutely beautiful. They have um, beautiful striations on the cusp. And again, this is one that Sam has prepped out um, very painstakingly because these wee cusps are so, so delicate. And quite often when you do find the tooth, it, they are just broken. And unfortunately, because they are delicate, quite often they were broken before they were actually preserved as a fossil. Um, here's some other examples of Cybotis. So the one on the right hand side you can see here has been stuck back together and that is because it just did not break out of the rock properly. But you might think what is the point in saving something like this but because Cybotis is quite rare any records that we have of Cybotis is very important in looking at overall at the, the fauna and the sort of diversity of these early Carboniferous marine environments. And there's a nice one here on the left hand side where you can see it's actually sitting and there's a wee rugose coral underneath. And um, this one here is perfectly preserved and you can see quite well those cusps in there. And to be honest, these would have been pretty gnarly uh, predators when they were around. I mean, if, if that went in because of these striations, it kind of acts to stop the the suction pulling the teeth out of the mouth. So, um, you know, it gives them a really good grip on the prey and what they would have been eating. But on the back of this one um, is the root, and the root is quite flat, and again, that gives them that added leverage, and it just meant that they were able to have that kind of strength uh, when they were eating and swallowing their prey whole. Um, and this one is called a Pristodus. Now, Pristodus, these look really, really weird. So I've drawn um, a rough diagram of what is the upper dentition and the presumed lower dentition. Now, these are teeth in the sense it's what the animal used for eating, but they were more like tooth plates. So um, what we think is that it would have had this lower dentition, which just like the one that you can see in the picture here, and um, that would have just had one cusp. However, the upper dentition is thought to be multi-cusped. Now, interestingly, the only Pristodus that I have ever found have all been the presumed lower dentition. But some of them do tend to have a slightly different peak on the end. So we're trying to look at this as well, and look at the morphology of these to see if there is any variation, because there has been some work done on American carboniferous 
cover inheritance deposits where they think it might actually be a feature that distinguishes between the male and female. So it would be really interesting if we could find more data on that. Um, the upper dentition, now, as I say, I've not found one of these and I don't know whether it's because this one was more likely to survive, it was less likely to get broken, or indeed, is it just because it was more fragile, it's more likely to have been broken up before it's actually preserved as a fossil, um, which is something that it, it's quite important to remember when you're, you're looking at your data and trying to work out what you're actually seeing is that obviously a lot of the time that picture is not going to be complete. So there will be certain conditions that will favor um, preservation of certain animals. So for example, I have not found any soft parts of the shark preserved, um, which would be obviously the ideal dream to find cartilage preserved um, along with teeth or dentition so that you can actually try and work out how that animal lived and, and how those dentitions fitted together. Um, there has been some really cool findings in Kentucky. Um, they found a Cyvodus in a cave wall there, which is not been fully excavated yet, but it'll be really cool to see because they think that they've actually got more or less a complete jaw of the, the Cyvodus. So um, it'd be really exciting to see what happens with that. And you never know, there could be some out there in Fife. We just uh, just need to find them. But Pristodus, uh, quite, they remind me of sort of the beaks that kind of like cephalopods had and also like puffer fish. Um, and they would have eaten other small fish, but also uh, they could have eaten mollusks and things as well. Um, but I've got some other interesting things that I wanted to uh, add in as well. So these are from the local area as well, and rhizodonts are a very famous uh, fossil and they were they grew to be absolutely massive up to seven meters in length and it makes it one of the biggest freshwater fish to have ever lived and but what i find so interesting about this fossil is if you look really closely there's a rise of one tooth here but this rock is actually a marine rock so this um if you remember that bryzoan i showed you that i said was from that quite shaly material it's quite soft um, well, this is from the same bed, or presumed to be the same bed, based on the, the types of fossils that were seen in there. Um, but it, it means we know that there was definitely a freshwater influence to uh, this marine system. And it makes a lot of sense because a lot of the, the black hole limestone and these lower limestone formation deposits are preserved in a Yordale cycle. So you are getting um, deltaic influx of sediments, which was happening from the west. Um, and you can see that quite nicely in the sandstones that overlay a lot of these limestones. But what we need to try and do with this is... First of all, can we find any more rhizodon teeth in this material, but also can we find any more of this material? Because it is so soft, um, if this has been um, put into a spoil heap or anything, it will just be decaying in there. So um, it's a case of you know trying to salvage what we can and see what information is there. But rhizodonts um, are not uncommon uh, round about the Fife coast. Um, the rocks that you get up towards uh, Weems, um, you would have get, get rhizodonts there as freshwater deposits and you can find some really, really beautiful rhizodont teeth in there. Um, but they're definitely one of those animals that because they're quite iconic, it's always quite cool when you find one. And it kind of adds a little bit to, you know, tells you a little bit about the kind of vertebrates that would have been living at that time. And uh, their teeth as well had a similar function where they've got these longitudinal grooves and it's similar to ichthyosaurs and it would have just prevented their teeth being ripped out by suction uh, when they were eating. So when uh, talking about fossils, um, obviously the main thing most people want to know is where can they go to look for fossils? So as I said, unfortunately a lot of sites are um, either on private land or they are triple SIs, but there is a reason for that. Um, you know, those the early Carboniferous sharks, for example, um, they, well, they're a really good example of this, is that they're still very poorly understood. Um, there's a lot of analysis being done on different sites, but in particular, the West Five sites haven't been studied in that much, much detail, um, and particularly the diversity of the, um, the marine vertebrates that were there at the time. 
but because these sites and they are quite specialist fossils and do require quite a lot of work and um, they're not that much fun if you if I take my friends out fossil hunting and um, to look for shark teeth they're generally bored within five minutes you know people like to go and actually see things um, so one of the fav my favourite places is the one I mentioned before, which is Preston Island. So this is an image just looking back down the fourth. Um, you can just see the, make out the bridges in the distance. Um, this rock is all black hole limestone, um, making the sea defence. And the path runs right along beside this. Um, so you can walk along and it's great. It's really accessible. It's quite a flat walk and you can take kids with you. And it's a really, really great place to go because you will see so much there. And um, you'll essentially see big beds where you'll see corals. So you'll have Brugos corals living in between um, colonial corals. Then you'll see these massive big blocks which are just absolutely full of crinoids and then brachiopods. And um, there's some really cool mineralization. It's just a really nice place to go because it's, you know, you're not having to climb up any big hills. It's flat. Um, and if the weather is nice, um, as you can see, it looks absolutely beautiful on a, a nice sunny day but there is some other places that you can go as well so um, although the beach um, and a lot of the coast is a triple SI that doesn't mean that you can't go there and look for fossils so one of my favorite things to do is to walk up and down bits of the five coast and, and just look at stuff in situ or even just turn over bits of shingle and you can find all sorts of amazing plant material and particularly up towards uh, Dyser and Weems um, you'll find material there which is it's actually weathering out of the old spoil heaps from the coal working so it's it's not in situ again but um, you know if you go and have a look you'll find all sorts of really nice bits of lepidodendron and um, other carboniferous plant fossil which are really quite famous um, another really good one is Seafield. Now at Seafield near Kirkcaldy, you can actually see uh, the black hall limestone there and in situ you'll see the, the limestone which is of the same age. Again, uh, you can't hammer, it is a triple SI, but if you walk down and look at the bedrock on a low tide, uh, you will see some absolutely amazing uh, bryzone mats and um, fossil corals and there's actually some piratization of some of the materials. So um, basically fills gold uh, preserved fossils on the surface and and it's a great place to go and um, obviously the health and safety of that if you are going to go to the beach to look for fossils please make sure you check tide times and everything before you go um, and don't stand underneath any cliffs or spoil heaps um, but there are some really good places to go that I would suggest are, are probably quite accessible and a good place to go if you've got a family and you just want to have a look and explore um, but there's also um, sort of the kind of urban geology, which I also really like as well, especially, um, particularly with lockdown, people who are living in towns and cities aren't able to get out into the countryside, um, you know, there is geology all around you. Uh, one of my favourite five fossil, fossils is actually this lepidodendron, which was found in one of the collieries, um, Town Hill, which is north of Dunfermline. And when it was found, it was taken and put in Pittencreef Park. Then a few years ago, pupils from the Town Hill Primary School basically wrote to the council and requested that it be returned back to Town Hill. Um, they were creating a new mining heritage garden um, and it's now back there in its original home. And I think that's a really good example of sort of community engagement with their local fossil heritage. These kids obviously realised, well, it was found here, so why can't we have it back here? Um, so you can go and see that and it's really cool. There's some other information about the mining heritage, which is worth looking at as well. Um, but that's one of those uh, sort of cool uh, fossils that you can go and see and you know you don't need to go and track up big hills or anything and um, there's also another really good one in Dunfermline uh, which is the Dunfermline Abbey Churchyard so graveyards are one of uh, a one of the really surprising places where you can go to look at geology um, and it's something that I'm always banging on about is is how good the geology is there and um, but Dunfermline Abbey Churchyard um, actually has some really beautiful uh, fosterly marble there which is from County Durham and this is supposedly um, part of St Margaret's Shrine so when she died in 1093 she buried at Dunfermline Abbey um, and nothing really remains of her shrine but apparently her highly de decorated casket was placed on top of this rusterly marble um, and this is absolutely full of these Rugos corals and they've also made a bench out of it 
on one side of the abbey so you can go in there and have a look and that's again looking at you know a different type of rock but it's right there in the middle of the town and um, so it's one of my favorite places to go and sit and then you can compare that to the kind of corals that you're seeing in the, the rocks around Fife um, you know and, and start doing your own sort of comparative analysis which is I always think is really good. And, but I just wanted to mention some useful tools as well because um, when you're the, the main thing when you want to go and look for fossils is what are the rocks that are near you so um, my go-to is normally the British Geological Survey iGeology app which I'm sure most of you have heard of but if not it's absolutely brilliant and um, if you download that you can then locate yourself and have a look and see what's underneath you so um, on the screenshot I've got here you can see that it's telling me that I'm on top of uh, the Clackmannan group sedimentary uh, bedrock and it's carboniferous so I know that it's sedimentary therefore it's likely to have fossils so if you're finding igneous material which is stuff that's uh, you know your volcanoes or metamorphic rock um, you're very unlikely to find fossils there so you want to be looking for the sedimentary things but another app that works quite well alongside that is your natural history museum fossil explorer app and um, if you look at that you can locate yourself and it'll tell you really great sites um, and another one is the London Pavement Geology, and I know obviously London, um, but the app itself is only based around London just now, but the website, if you go on there, has been extended to the rest of the UK. Um, so there's lots of sites logged around Edinburgh, so I know that there's lots for the pavement fossil fish that you can go and investigate, but um, over the next few weeks I will be inputting a lot of data for sites around Fife. Um, so hopefully uh, they'll be on there soon and you know you'll be able to have a look and, and go and visit these like the um, frostily marble and things and um, I just wanted to mention those um, you know just as a sort of starter for MD but if MD has got any questions I'm always happy for people to email me you know if you're not sure whether you're where you're going is on private land or if it's a triple SI it is always best to check these things and um, so you know get in touch or you can get in touch with your local museum and things and more than happy to offer advice on that but i'm leaving you with this absolutely geeky photo of a uh, cyvodus that i got tattooed on my knuckles because obviously why would you not get the best carboniferous shark tattooed on your knuckles um, and i just want to say thank you for people letting me talk today and talk about my favorite thing which is fossils and i hope you found it interesting and does md have any questions